All right, teammates, 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 we are back once again. As always, if this is your first time listening to the Move Swiftly podcast, welcome to the show. Welcome to the number one show on innovative teamwork. To my regular listeners, you already know how I get down, man. Right to the point, Mr. ABC. Always be connecting. Every single person you hear on this show, I vet it out well. I listen to, and trust me, I, today's no different. I have another gem of a person that I happen to have the great fortune of meeting through this absolute, actually this new, this new platform I just got clicked on to called Podmatch, and it's it's a great platform by the way for any podcasters out there that want to be on shows and want to increase their podcast game and all that. Podmatch.com, but it's all that you know. <laughs> I, I was just telling him before we started recording, um, it's clear to me that we're definitely going to keep things as organic as possible because this is one of those guys that I wanted to make sure I reemphasize to him there are no time limits on this Move Swiftly podcast because everything he's about, everything he's been through from the way he lives his life, from the way he tries to help actual people and the reason he's in business. I, I want to I reemphasize, it's the reason you get into business that is so very important towards your overall success. So the, the, I, the founder of Sharpen Iron Spear, right? Coach Sharpen Iron Spear. Spear Coaching, Mr. Richard Walsh. Welcome to the Move Swiftly podcast. Great to have you. I just want to thank so much, man. I really love being here. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, it's sharpen the spear coaching. Sharpen the spear coaching. Now, <laughs> that one that one hits a – actually, that starts me off because that hits a trigger with me. And back in 2002, I was, a, I was a member of a youth football team named the White Oak Warriors, and we had gone from the Michigan colors to the Florida State logo. And we won the championship in 02 and we took Florida State's uh we took Florida State saying in that fear the spear, fear the spear, fear the spear. So there's already so many little like synergetic things that we can talk about. But I I first and foremost want to just get this out the way now in terms of because a lot of things, what got me in the business or what kind of one of the things that I wanted to learn when I moved to Florida four years ago was how to teach a football player how to box. You know, I wanted to add that to my skill set and I got really, really good at it to the point where I wrote a book on how boxing actually helps you in all sports, whether you're a football player, whether you're a woman who's been in a domestic abuse situation, whether you're a kid like me who gets bullied or anything, whatever the situation is, knowing and having that confidence and that self-awareness of knowing how to box and things of that nature. That's something that I, I really am passionate about. So you I know, have a career in boxing. You are also just as passionate about it. So I think the best way to start off the interview or start off the conversation is talk to us a little bit about your background and then how you initially got into boxing and that, you know, how it kind of equates to the success you've had in business as well. Sure. Yeah. It's well, I got in the boxing right after I got out of the Marine Corps. So I was in the Marine Corps. I got out of that was working at a buddy who boxed. I'm like, I want to box. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a guy who likes to do that. I have a warrior mindset. So oh, this yeah. was, so this was younger, like right after, like what age were you when you got uh, out? 21. 21. 21. Yes. So you're still a young man. Right. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. So young and dumb still. So uh, yeah. All of us. Dumb all of us. The dumb part comes in handy when you want to get punched in the face. And the sad part is there's some 41 year olds who are still young and dumb, but we won't start that conversation. <laughs> that's known as the extended adolescence, right? And that's right. <laughs> get that later. But uh, so I started, and it's kind of, I'll, I'll tell you the fun time in the ring story. Mm -hmm. Okay. The guy I sparred with, I, I worked at the bar at the time. I was a manager. He was the head doorman, and um, his name was Dave. We called him Crazy Dave, okay? He was South London kickboxing champion, box monster. We're talking 240, rip, play with 350 on the bench, you know, all day long. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, I want to box. I said, well, come on down to the gym. So I got down first, looked up, got the mouthpiece, got in the ring. And Dave's cool. He's not trying to kill me. He's just playing. I can't mm -hmm. lay a glove on him. Swing and swing and swing. Right? He's just, he's slipping yeah, and moving. Smart, okay. Yeah, smart. Right, and, right. Yeah. And he just looks at me and then pop with a jab right on my nose, right? Bam. And he breaks my nose. Okay. Oh, you don't know that at the time, but there it is bleeding. I'm like, I'm okay. Keep going. Huh. Keep going. Second round, <laughs> the bell rings. I come out and he's just looking again. And then it's pop with a left hook. And that's what I'm telling you. My mouthpiece out of my mouth out of the ring and across the gym. Wow. And my head just, whoa. Oh, I was like, holy cow. You know, so then we got done and I'm wiping. I go, am I going to blow my nose? I'm like, don't do that. I blow my nose. 
two black eyes, right? So I got two big old black eyes because you don't want to blow your nose when, when, when you break it. So, okay, so I go back to work, right? And I'm sitting there and then the general manager comes in, he sees me. So I'm <laughs> two black eyes. <laughs> <middle of America. laughs> yeah, and then he's like, what happened to you? I go, oh, I was smart. Well, who? I go, well, Dave, he goes, you can't do that. Look at you. I go, oh, I'm, I'm going back tomorrow. I'm going to get better at this. You know, wow. and I kept going. He goes, well, you're not going to be able to work here. I go, well, then I'll quit. I said, I'm doing this. I didn't know why. <laughs> I just wow. wanted to do this. So I went back and, uh, yeah, my first guy in a fight with had 40 fights. He was uh -huh. in the army, right? And I fought him. Okay, I got some, yes, my, my trainer threw the towel in. I thought I was doing fine. He threw the towel in. Mm -hmm. um, I'm like, okay, I'll get better. My second fight, I fought a Marine. Stopped him in the second round. So mm -hmm. I was already getting better. Anyway, so I persisted on that. I trained six days a week. Um, loved, loved to train. Just mm -hmm. loved the training aspect. Fights were cool. Kind of anticlimactic for me. I just loved the training aspect. Um, got good, got good. Won state gold gloves champion, copper gloves, all kinds of really cool stuff. So I did really well. Um, and then I know I look really pretty, but you wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. This nose was broke seven times and actually detached from my face. I broke the uh, cheekbone in my face, so I had plates and wires, putting all that back together. I had nerve damage on the side of my face. Hmm. Um, and, like, I don't box anymore, okay, in the ring. <laughs> yeah. So, so I trained them. I kept my skills sharp all these years, yeah. 30 plus years. Um, and I love it. I love it. Hitting the bag this morning. I do it every day, and uh, I love it. So the mindset of coming back and, you know, you know the four steps you got to go up to get inside the ring? Mm -hmm. Okay. Those are your biggest, th those create the most fear. Those steps every day. I had to step up, go through those yeah. ropes, either take a beating or get a beating. Yeah. Okay? So that's business. Amen. Okay? Amen. That, that is business every day. And every day I'd be like, okay, here I go. I got to get it. Some days I did the beating, mm -hmm. and some days I got the beating. More days I got the beating, but you learn from those. Mm -hmm. That's where you get the skills. You don't learn by by working out with someone less than you. Right. I was sparring pros. I was sparring the best that I could all the time, you know, and doing what I had to do. And that, that gave me the skills now that I still have. I'm mm -hmm. still a dangerous man. Yeah. I like but what do you so what do you attribute now that you're looking back on it? You know, this is back when you were 21 and the majority of 21 year olds say, look, I'm keeping my job. I got a paycheck and I don't want to get my ass kicked. Right. What do you attribute that mindset being like? Where do you think that came from to where you decided something that I can I can almost promise you 99 percent of the people out there would have said, hey, it makes more sense to keep my job. I'm not going to probably fight pro. I'm already 21. What do you think led to that decision to, to keep fighting? Well, like I said, young and dumb. Mm -hmm. okay? But I just here's my thought at that time. It's like, well, I can get a job anywhere. Mm go work anywhere like making money is like the easiest thing you can do in the world mm -hmm. I mean, making money is like it is the easiest thing you can do next okay. to waking up in the morning that's pretty easy too you know okay. if you wake up in the morning you've reached average okay yeah. so you're an average person just by waking up so if you stay average all day well we can talk about that later <laughs> you want to do that mm -hmm. i'm like well I, i'm gonna still do this and i can work somewhere else of course they didn't fire me and they needed me so i didn't get fired i just kept right. going to move but but it's that it's it, it's that dedication to a goal that never wavers, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want something, nothing is I get it in five minutes. I'm not. I don't think about the next sixty seconds. I think about the long term. Mm -hmm. I think about what does it mean when you get to that point? And I can have that. You know, like like me and some buddies like all talked about going to the Marine Corps. We're growing up and stuff, you know. And we're gonna do this. And guess who went? Me. One person. Okay. <laughs> so, right. No, nobody went anywhere. I just, I'm the one who went and did it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my son now is in the Marine Corps, which is really cool, okay. but it's, it, it's that, it's that, it's that dedication to a goal. That's yes. what it's really about. Well, all right. So we, so we have that, right. And you know, you're getting better. You obviously you're training, you're doing your thing and you are, you, you're, you're feeling the confidence. Cause I, again, I'm a, I train people out of box. When these ladies start learning how to throw a jab across the uppercut a hook, they start talking. They start feeling like it, it is a level of confidence that they just walk around with this presence on. All right. Mm -hmm. And it's called again, I, I said the right word. It's confidence. Where exactly in the timeline now do you have the confidence to go up to a business owner and tell this stubborn business owner that thinks they know everything? Hey, you're in prison. 
All right. You're letting the business run you and you're not running the business. Talk to us about, I mean, you have a book about it, the whole thing. And just the title in itself was hitting a whole lot of triggers with me. So, you know, kind of fill us, fill in the blanks for us, if you will, please. Right. Right. So Escape the Owner Prison. That's the name of the book. And the subtitle is The Contractor's New Way to Scale, Regain Control, and Fast Track Growth While Loving Life. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a lot. And and that title and that subtitle was the hardest thing I did in the whole book. Yes, well, <laughs> I, I, I can resonate. I wrote the book, the book, right? so, By the time you yeah, get through the whole book, you're like the title, the, the, the subtitle is so important. Yeah, it's it's right. I tell people I had 27 working titles. Mm -hmm. I went with the 28th one. Okay, I had to come with 28 to make it work. Right. And it's good. But what that is, S1, is that the prison is you get into work. So you start a business. And we've all, if you've been in business, you started at one point, one way or another. And it's always hard work. Mm -hmm. And I haven't figured out the secret to make it not hard work. I got a lot of other secrets I figured out, but mm -hmm. that first two years, you're going to put in a lot of hours, a lot of work. You're going to do everything mm -hmm. for the most part, right? You're going to do everything. Okay. Well, you get going. Like I said, what's the easiest thing to do in business? Make money. It's the easiest thing to do in business. It's everything else that's difficult. So now you got to do everything and mm -hmm. make money. Now you're going two years. Now you're year two. You're making the money. Okay, maybe not all the money you want, but you're making money, right? You're supporting yourself. You're doing the things you want to do in the business, but you're also doing the accounting. You're doing the selling. You're doing the marketing. You're doing every aspect of it, right? Running the guys, running the crew, doing whatever you're doing, okay? And then you're like, okay, that's good. I'm going. I'm making money. But now where do you go? So here's what happens. I talked to guys who have been in business 10 years. Mm -hmm. And guess what they've done five times? They've repeated the first two years five times. Hmm. They never get, they never get to the scaling point. They never get to where they can grow and expand because they feel they they taught themselves how to do everything. Mm -hmm. And if they went in as what I call a technician, someone great at something, whether mm -hmm. you're a carpenter or a plumber, or you're a technician, you're a IT guy, whatever it is, you're really good at it. And you decide you could do it better than the guy you're working for. Mm -hmm. That's great, great motivation. But the reality is, you being the best at it, thinking you have to do it because you're the best at it, that's the prison. Okay. That's a big part of the prison. That's one of the doors that are that are locked on you. Because mm -hmm. you can you got to learn to delegate. Okay. If you can give it in, now someone might not be as good as you, 100 percent is good, but they're 95% mm -hmm. as good. And here's the reality: your customers don't know the five percent difference. Mm -hmm. They don't because it's still great. Right. And if you build it right and systemize it right and build a plan, they can be as good as you and, and execute your offering perfectly. Mm -hmm. That's what gives you freedom or the it's the beginning of freedom anyway. So there's a lot of things you have to do, but that, so the first thing is like realize that other people can do what I do. Right. And I do that in my custom water feature business. One day I painted out where the water feature is going to go, told my guys I've been working for years, face it this way, blah, blah, blah. Come, I come back at the end of the day, it's done. The homeowner walks out of the back on the back porch, sees this water feature and goes, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And I just went, I'm free. They don't need me. They don't need to be now. I would have done this or I would have done that. I would have put a rock a little bit. That's just me being an artist. Yeah. Okay. The homeowner loved it, thrilled, felt she underpaid for something unbelievable. Right. Mm -hmm. All the right things. I was free. I don't have to be here moving rocks, placing rocks, digging holes with my guys. They don't mm -hmm. need me anymore. That was really freeing. That was a beautiful thing. So what, you get kind of the idea, right? Yeah, I get the idea, but obviously it's very it's easier said than done because as you're talking, the question that's coming in my mind is what do you attribute or what level do you have to deal with the the big E G O, the ego? You know, and, and speaking, it doesn't have to just be men, but it's men and women, and they have the artist mindset they have the artist mindset they don't have necessarily have the art entrepreneur mindset and they got in business to be that practitioner they got in business to actually do the thing and when it comes to you telling them hey start to delegate you know you're doing too much on your own and there's other people who are doing it not even just as good as you but good enough and their system is running a whole lot better and they're going to beat you out how do you communicate that to someone who is so stuck in their own way um that you, they look at you like I'm. I'm good, or they'll they'll, they'll go in one ear and out the other. How, how do you well, deal? With that? Well, what moves us the most is pain. Mm. Pleasure is cool, mm -hmm. but it doesn't move us like pain does. Okay, so people like that, and I was one. 
You have to reach a point of pain to realize that. Okay. And here's what happened to me. So like 20 years, I'm going like this and I got yeah. approved, but I'm doing everything. I'm hustling. And I loved what I did. Mm -hmm. Like it just, it was me. That's why I started steel sculpture. Say, Hey, I want to do that too. So I, I taught myself how to well. I, now I have world-class awesome. exhibits. I built steel sculpture, like unbelievable. Right. But I was one of the lucky artists because I'm a businessman. I sold everything I made. Mm -hmm. I was never a starving artist. Yeah. <laughs> cool stuff people right. want to pay me for it. So that mm -hmm. was my idea, right? But here's the thing with those people when they're there, until they understand the pain, and here's mine. I'll show you mine. Yeah. Really. So after so 08, 09 hit, right? Big economic crash. Everything just came to a complete stop. Everything, the work evaporated. And one day I lost a half a million dollars. Oh my God. Was like, no, nope, we're holding on. I can remember it was right after the election and everything was November 5th of 2008. And it was like everyone, and they weren't wrong to hold on to their money because mm -hmm. no one knew what was happening. Yeah. The world was crashing, right? So they didn't need a water feature in their backyard. They could wait. Okay. Mm -hmm. They really, you know, uh, so I'm like, yeah, okay. Because I think you were the one, right, right. You were like, I'm a luxury. I'm a luxury. I'm a luxury, luxury expense, right? So, right. So I tell them, okay, well, I think this is over. I looked at my office manager and said, I, I think it's over. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I'm not blaming the economy. What I'm actually doing is saying, look what that did. And why couldn't I survive it? Mm -hmm. That's the real question. That's the pain. So I my business crashed. I lost my home. I had six children, four years and younger. My wife, okay, everything is gone. Now I had, I had to move. I had to change states. I had to do all this stuff, right? Because I couldn't sustain my business. So we did the move. I did everything I had to do, relocated, started over. I got, what am I going to do now? Okay, I've worked myself for 20 years. I am unemployable. Okay, I'm mm -hmm. a phenomenal employee, the best you'd ever have for about 12 months. Then right. I'm going to want to run your business. Yeah, because okay. and, I, and I don't mean to cut you off, but I want to make sure I pause you there. And it's important that you listeners make sure you get a grasp of that. When you've tasted that feeling of making your own money through you, know, like I like I actually have it. Do I have it here? Yeah, when you taste that feeling, when I sold a first my copy of this, there's no way anyone can employ you. You may have a job, you may have people paying you every two weeks, but when someone pays you money out of because of the stuff coming out of your own head, it come it could be it could be a dollar, it could be twenty five cents. That feeling of putting your heart and soul into something, some sort of art, some sort of creation, and somebody paying you for it, you are, at that point you are unemployable. You are psychologically unemployable. Congratulations. Now again, I'm not telling you to go and quit your job or you don't have a job, but mindset wise, what it does for you, it, you again, just like you, I've lost everything. I had my car be possessed. I was sleeping out of a car. I that feeling of hitting rock bottom, and I felt like I'm good. Because <laughs> I have it in my head, the artistry mindset in my head. So I get like, by the way, this this happens on the show all the time. When people start talking my language, I get excited. I get really Good. excited. It's okay. Good. 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 I'm, I'm okay, man. I love it. <laughs> so and, and it is that because once you learn that, so so I'll break it down even more. It's mm -hmm. really about no limits, no caps. So I'll give you a, a, an example. The guys that tell me they you know, they're a union carpenter. Oh, yeah. I'm making $28 an hour. I make $32 an hour. I go, yeah, but you can't make $33 an hour. They won't let you. Wow. They tell you how much you make. You, It sounds good. I make 33 bucks an hour. Yeah. But do you know how much I make? Because I set the number. I used mm -hmm. to tell people I'd shovel 35 tons of granite in one day in mm -hmm. Phoenix, 100 degrees, spread in the backyard. I made $1,000 in eight hours. Mm -hmm. I don't have to do math to know it's better than $33 an hour. It is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I'm like, get a taste of that. It's just what you're saying. Get a taste of that. Yes. When I was working for someone making $6 an hour to do the same thing. Yes. Back in the day. Okay. Do that math. You'll never go back. Yeah. Okay. You don't. You don't. And you, you get don't. to decide how much or how little. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about, right? So that was the big key, the big realization, like, okay, what am I going to do? I, but I want to do something I like because I won't do things I don't like. Mm -hmm. So I have that too. Like I'm not, I could get, if I want to be, if I want to be, do something I don't like, I'll go get a job. Mm -hmm. okay, that's what jobs are to me. Okay. The, right. what do they say? Just over broke, J-O-B. Just, just over broke. I, that's, just, that's what that is. But yeah. so <laughs> I just had to start the process again. You know, I love training people. I'm an athlete. I've done all this great stuff and boxer mm -hmm. and black belt and all this cool stuff. And so I started training people again. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. So I went to a gym and they, oh, they need personal trainers. Okay. I'll do that for now. Well, you know what happens, right? Yeah, uh, no. In a year, I'm trainer of the year. Okay. I'm the best <laughs> cutting the whole thing. And mm-hmm. I'm like, okay. But then I'm like, oh, I guess and I'll then, well, time out before you go. That's without a certification, folks. So all you trainers out there spending all this money on certifications, there you have it. You got it. all right, NASM, all that stuff. Uh, it really doesn't yeah, it's, and there's that's another conversation. Yeah, exactly. I can talk yeah. all day long on right. uh but so I did that. I'm like, well, I'll just go open my own gym. Because I have a different idea for a gym. I want to do a boot camp style, you know, take my training ticket and do all by it. Really cool. So I did that. Mm-hmm. Ooh, that blew up. That was fantastic. I'm like, okay, now let's look at business. What did I do wrong? Actually, I got to swing back here to talk about that pain. So let me go back. When we talk about pain moving someone who's mm-hmm. stuck and I'm an artist and everything else. So I had the collapse, right? But during that period, right, right when all that's happening, I woke up one day and it's a true epiphany moment. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting, I sit in my bed and I think, I'm thinking about my, my six little kids. Okay. And I'm thinking, you know, when I come home at night, which is usually late because I work a lot, my kids attack me. Just want to see me. They hug me. They run me. You know, they're four, three, two years old. Really cool. When I leave, and one time this actually happened, my one son chasing my truck down the driveway crying because I'm leaving. Now, picture that in your rearview mirror. I'm looking at it now, enough yeah. to work to make that money, right? I'm looking and at I'm it. Like, you know, they don't care what I drive. They don't care where we live. They don't care what I do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cause my identity was really wrapped up in what I did. I was mm-hmm. my company. Right. And I said, they, they don't care. This stuff doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Like I'm putting everything in that. And, and if I continue this path, as these kids grow up, all they're going to know is business comes first. It comes before your faith. It comes before your family. It becomes before everything, mm-hmm. right? And I will destroy them as human beings. They'll never have a good relationship because they'll be driving, driving. They'll be all the ambition and no balance, right? So I'm like, I can't do that. I just, I, so I have to do this differently, right? So yeah. that that was the big push. That's one of me. I really had to like, that was, that was understanding that my identity can no longer be in my business, yeah. So my business is called Rick Rock. I didn't put my name in it, right? Mm-hmm. So I had I had a video. I don't know where it is anymore, but I had it burning all my uniforms, like brand new stuff out of the bag. Like never again. I'll never again. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna identify with my business. I will be great at whatever I do, but it's not gonna be about me anymore. Yes. I'm gonna be around for my children. I'm gonna really homeschool them all the yeah. way through. Right now, they're all graduating high school and everything else. All homeschooled, and I was there for them. I still worked. I built businesses, but the mindset was completely different. My approach, which is what changed, which is why I wrote Escape the Owner Prison, because mm-hmm. I want to help other people do that. That pain is what made me rethink. And also what helped me accept, well, I'll call it the temporary defeat of my original business almost 20 years. You know, and you just took me back to when I was a kid, because I have, I have a father that's very similar to you with the mindset of he started his own business and it drove, it drives him even to this day, it drives him to the point where he's changed the voicemail on his phone to architectural solutions, architectural solutions, and he's run it and run it. And it's a business. And he had, I have me and him again. I'm like you, I listened to you earlier where I love my father very much. Own, owe him the world has done absolutely everything for me, but our clashing moments have been all about business have been all about me graduating from college and being him. My mother tells me all the time, you are just like him in terms of how driven you are to succeed, how driven you are. Like, even with this, I'm not rescheduling a podcast because there's there's people doing something in the building. No, we're getting it done. Like, that drive. Yeah, so I yes. get that from him. But I, I got to thank you from the son's perspective because in many ways, you had the ability to say, look, I'm letting this go because my sons and my kids are not going to just think it's all business, 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 business. I got to give them some balance. So, you know, with that, I I, I want to bring up, I want to make sure we talk about this, is where did you develop your walk of faith? Where did you develop your relationship with God? At least, and again, you don't, I mean, you don't have to go into details, but just when did you start to get to know God? Because it was in these moments when me and my father were clashing that I started to say, man, I got a different father. I got a different, like a higher spread. I got, I got, faith that I have to walk. So, you know, when, when did that uh, breakthrough moment, that insight kind of happen that, for you? <laughs> that's awesome. And I will always talk about Jesus. Please. <laughs> I got no problem. With much. Okay. So, uh, wow. It's pretty amazing, you know, because I call it, 
I was a Sino. Know what a Sino is? I Christian in name only. Christian. <laughs> okay. First I went to church. Now, but... <laughs> right. I went to church and I did my little thing and maybe I paid a little tithing here and there and all that. And I thought I was a Christian, whatever that is. Yeah. Okay. It's a pretty ambiguous term these days. Right. Yeah. So um, now I go by believer, Christ follower. Right. It's a very, very different mindset. And I'll get into that. But Absolutely. so I started as a Mormon as a child. Mm -hmm. to that, then left that about 17, joined the core, did all that, kind of went my way of the world. Okay, mm -hmm. followed that. Okay, and that was all business, do all that stuff good. And then I started going, a friend of mine reintroduced me, right, to Christ through his example of the way he lived. Okay, didn't swear, we're in the same business and everything else. I'm like, wow. And actually, <laughs> the reason I don't swear anymore is because of him. Mm -hmm. And one day, I was going off. We're at a, a big exhibit we're doing at the at Navy Pier in Chicago. And I'm effing this and effing that. And this, this, things are going. And finally, he looked at me and goes, language. He just like, he couldn't, he's like, and we're like best friends. I'm like, and I looked at him. I was like, oh, I just, I mean, just that he's yeah, never said that before. Yeah. From that day on, I like, you know, at least I stopped. I, I worked on it, right? It's a lot you're, of work. You're cognizant of it. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, or it's like say, now, now I don't swear out loud. Mm -hmm. out loud. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if you could ever not swear in your mind, but to, to, it's it's a fair point because I I still work on that to this day. My mom listens to this show. It's like, man, clean your mouth up, boy. So yeah. it's it's so, not an easy it's not an easy task. <laughs> that's right. So from that point, I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to church with them. I'm doing that now. I'm getting married at 34. I get married. Okay, great. Um, still doing the church, me going that. Now we have our first child at 39, and that's a whole other story to talk about uh, mm -hmm. those kids. But at mm -hmm. that, and then, and then I'm like, okay, and I'm going along. And then everything claps, and we move. We move to Wisconsin from Illinois, you know. And I'm there, and I'm going to a couple different churches. I'm at a church, and then one day I'm like, I'm I'm typing on my computer, sending the email. My wife's like, who you email? And I go, oh, the pastor. She goes, about what? I go, well, about being saved. She goes, what do you mean? I go, well. Everyone's got this date when they when they be you know they were born again mm -hmm. and they're a believer and all. So I'm like, well, I don't have a date. I don't. I want a date. I don't have a date. Mm -hmm. What does this mean? Being saved? Like all the churches, the Christian churches I went to, never talked about. There's never altar calls. They weren't bringing people up to accept Christ. They didn't tell you why you need to. They didn't tell you what you know being born again. Is. Like the whole biblical reason, mm -hmm. the whole thing the Bible is about. They never talked about. Kind of right. funny about a Christian church. Right. So I'm like, she's like, she goes, well. She's just looking at me like, what are you talking about? I go, well, you get you have a date? She goes, well, yeah. And she gives me the date. And I'm mm -hmm. like, see, you got a date. Everybody's got a date. I don't have a date. You know, so that's kind of my way. I'm so I'm asking, yeah. like, what does this actually mean? So he was kind of helpful. Um, and I'm like, okay, now I'm starting to understand. I went to a different, you know, I had to go through a process, but then I finally realized like what that really means, that surrender. Mm -hmm. That, you know, people say he's my Lord and Savior. They like the savior part, but they don't like the Lord part. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, Lord, it means that I'm answerable to everything, to him. He's there. I surrender my life to him. Yeah. Right. So that was that was another big epiphany, right? I start understanding that. I'm like, wow, and I'm reading the Bible every day and I'm studying them. Just it just becomes part of me. And that grew and grew into like even like how I do business. Yeah. So I started looking like, well, okay, I'm, I'm seeing all these principles in the Bible. And how to operate, mm -hmm. how to be a godly person, what that yes. means, whether yes. it's it's weights and measures, right? It's all that, whatever told me, like, this is all business. This is all how you conduct business. It's in the yeah. Bible. I'm like, this is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking at it, but a lot of people don't do this. So how do you build with a kingdom mindset? So there's two mindsets that we work with. It's called the Pharaoh mindset mm -hmm. and the kingdom mindset. So that my my being a strong believer now, after you know over a decade of doing this stuff, so 15 years, um, I start to realize, well, there's there's two operating systems. There's the Pharaoh system, okay, time for dollars, mm -hmm. more people, less pay less, get more, give less, all right. The, that's Pharaoh mindset. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got a hundred thousand guys trying to get a giant stone up to the top of the pyramid and they can't do it. What does Pharaoh say? Well, we'll kill fifty thousand of them. He kills 50,000, the other 50,000 get it up the hill. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's feral motivation, okay? We don't right. operate that as Christians, right? As Christ follows, we don't operate that way. So how do we build a kingdom-based business? What uh -huh. does that look like? 
right? So that's when we started figuring out like, well, what what drives everything? Well, Habakkuk 2 2, right? Vision. vision. Right? It's playing on tablets so a man can pick it up and run. Right. Right. We need to build around with the vision. So we started to create how do we how do we build a vision driven business mm-hmm. that includes everybody? So uh, again, we can go on and on. But that from the face standpoint, that's one of this that that was such a big deal. And for my kids mm-hmm. to bring them up knowing the Lord. Again, so business wasn't everything. Now I'm around. Now I'm doing what matters now. Yes. You know, I'm doing what's important, like to make them, you know, children of God. Mm-hmm. who know who he is, who lean on him, cast their burdens on him so they can do life and do great things and give the glory to God. Yes, and well, there there's two points that I, I, we have to make sure we touch on for you listeners. Number one, it's you have to seek God. You have to seek the Lord. You have to understand that there's a higher power. There's someone there for you and that loves you regardless. You have got to seek it, all right? You were in a position where you had to seek it. You had hit rock bottom, had nothing, and you had to seek it. And that brings me to the second thing is, I don't know if we we, we actually have to make, make sure we mention this, is we got to shout out wife. We got to shout out your wife, you know, because she was there throughout this whole thing. Iron sharpens iron. The people, again, who you surround yourself, and again, I'm a former football player, former athlete. I'm in this world where you bring certain people in your circle, you start excuse me, you start dating this one, you start being around this one, you have just the wrong peer group in general, that P-E-E-R, that group of people that you have around you is going to be the difference on whether you make it in life or you do not. You got to have the people around you that will support you. You got to have the people around you that are going to make you better. You have to actively seek these kind of people because they don't come around very often. So to that, your thoughts on that, just in terms of, because we know, we know you, are doing great things but we know for a fact you've alluded to it to us throughout this entire episode it wasn't just you it is not just you by any means so speak on that a little bit yeah it's you, we are what we surround ourselves with yes okay and and that you want to be around people who are on the same mission as you mm-hmm. do they want to achieve do they want to do more do they want to affect the kingdom do they want to what, what do they want to do with their life mm-hmm. if they want to just sit around drink beer watch tv go to a movie do whatever, and that that's their life, and they put in their eight hours a day. You probably don't want to be around those people. My right. friend circle, and my kids, you know, give me a lot of, give me a, give me a hard time about this. It's really tiny. <laughs> I'm talking friends, like people mm-hmm. I want to hang out with. It's like a that. very small circle, okay? Because there's, I have standards. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I'm not Mister Exclusionary, but what I mean is, like, I want people who are going to build me up. Mm-hmm. I want a friend of mine is going to have my back, just yeah. like all the others. Right, no matter what, I call them trench buddies. Right, people I actually go to war with. Yes, you know, th- those are the people I want around me, and they're and they're hard to find. Yeah, they take time, and they take you know it's 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 effort and it's it's um, acclimation and everything else you got to have together on that. So when you're and even in business, who are you associating in business? If mm-hmm. I'm looking to network and grow my network, and I want to grow my business and find people want to help me, well, who am I actually talking to? Because there's some guys who are killing it the wrong way. Mm-hmm. They're doing it. They're they're getting the the fruit, if you will. Mm-hmm. But they're doing it all the wrong way. They're taking other people's fruit. Yeah. Right. So so they're not doing. They made a, a living off that. That's the sad part. They they made a living off that, and they look like they're being very successful. They look, you know, from the outside looking in. If you're a kid that doesn't really know much, you're gonna look at them as successful. That's the sad part. It's character, right? It's mm-hmm. all about character. There's a thing that we do. I teach my my clients Love. when we're hiring. We we look for three things: calling character and competency wow okay the least of those is competency because i can teach competency i can teach you to be better Mm -hmm. you can learn to get better at a skill or whatever right character unless you're like six and i'm working with you i can't do a lot with the character if you're a grown man or woman Mm -hmm. okay your character is your character I mean, it can change. I'm not saying you can't ever change, but that's beyond my pay grade. Exactly. It's beyond. I'm not going to have you in the company if, got, if you don't have a character. That you learned in the home. It's, it's years and years of doing the habits. Yeah. It's yeah, tough. Yeah, you're not unwinding. I, I personally deal with a lot of that, too. Right. And then calling. Are they actually called to do this work? Mm-hmm. Like, do they love it? Right. You know, if a guy's coming to work with me and we do mechanical things and I ask, like, what's his hobby? Well, I like to I like to redo old cars. I work on them. So, but, oh. He likes to work with his hands. He loves that. He okay. might really love this. He may be called to do this because he has the aptitude to do it, right? Mm-hmm. So 
calling character competency really important, right? Same thing in your friends, though. Like, who are they? Mm -hmm. In what scenario? What scenarios have you seen them do the right thing? And maybe when no one's watching, and they still did the right thing, mm -hmm. right? That kind of stuff. So those people are hard to find. Now, even in the church, yeah. Okay, there's great people. I like a lot of people, but you know, the ones that I'm tight, tight, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, I'm just selective. You know, I don't dislike other people, but they can't be inside the circle. Yes. Yeah. You know, there, there's rings, right? Yeah. There's different points of access to you as a leader, as a business owner, if you're dependent on size of your company or whatever it is. I even had to teach my owners that there's times when people can't get to you. Mm -hmm. Everyone can't have access to the owner at one point. Eventually you're going to be that. That's not what I do. I work on 5% of the business that only I can do. Mm -hmm. I've delegated, I've automated, and I've eliminated everything else. Mm -hmm. So they're out there in those other rings, but they don't get to just walk in and ask me questions because hmm. I have certain things I do and they definitely have certain things they're supposed to be doing. Right. And if I built the business right, they can operate because I built a system, I built mm -hmm. a process, they know how to do it and they have a chain of command to go to as well. Right. So that that's why that influence of who's around you is so critical. Right. So critical. And don't be bummed out if you don't have 7,000 Facebook friends or friends in general. If mm -hmm. you haven't met them and shook their hand and spent time with them, yeah. your friend. they're not your friend. Yeah. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, that's that's why I kind of got off. I social. hope you listeners caught that one. I really hope you caught that one. This is a Facebook fueled world. And I hope you because I I've said portions and, and versions of that for the past four years that it's so important that you get clear on that those people you meet on facebook that like all your posts they're not your friends i'm just gonna say it to you right now they're not your friends so i you know i want to be very i do want to be very respectful of your time so i, I do want to make sure we talk about what uh, what exactly are your serve first of all what exactly are your services and then given everything that you said how do you actually find the ideal client for you because that, I mean, based on the way you're talking, that could be that could be half the battle for you is just finding the right competent business owner and then coming up with an actual service. So what's that process like? So that's a really good question. So it's important in any business, okay? Mm -hmm. We call it the ICP. It's the ideal client profile. Right. So no matter, I don't care if you're selling popsicles mm -hmm. or you're selling high-end coaching or you're selling cars or you're, whatever you're doing, right? You're cleaning carpets. I don't care what you're doing. You have an ideal client. Mm -hmm. You have a person who you love to work for. That's what an ideal client is. Mm -hmm. They'll pay what you want to get for your services. They're, they love to refer you, right? They, they, they'll, they'll, they'll buy again from you all the time, right? Mm -hmm. they, they meet certain criteria. So one of the first things we do is, is we define who our ideal client is. Mm -hmm. Who is that? So what I do from a business standpoint as a business coach, so I've got, they, they've been in business five to 15 years. Yes. They have five to 50 employees. They're doing at least a million years gross revenue. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's where I want to be. That's the basic. Are they right there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I don't work with startups because startups, and when I tell people, I go, you don't have enough scars yet. Mm -hmm. you can't, remember we talked about the pain being the. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't have they don't have that yet. In that ring yet, man. They take those. That's right. You, you know this, baby. Yep. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying? I was a tough guy until you get punched in the face. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to go get punched in the face a few times, okay? Right. Because you can't value what I do because you haven't not done it. Yeah. yeah. Right? So you uh, haven't tried to go through it and find out you're stuck in that two-year cycle or whatever it is. Right. Um, so that's, that's the first critical thing. Um, understanding that now, okay, great. Now, how do I find them? Mm-hmm. Like, and everyone's like, oh, it's easy. It's just the internet. No, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you by tens of thousands of dollars why it doesn't work that way. Exactly. I've tried a lot of stuff, right? I've spent, what did I tell people? I told my, I told my wife, if we just had the money I lost, <laughs> we'd be mm -hmm. good. Yeah. You know, so sometimes it's just, Very true. business is, is, is painful. Education yeah. is expensive. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Education is expensive and you're learning by hard knocks. Uh, but what you end up doing is you find in the systems and there's incredible technology out there now that mm -hmm. can do amazing things. And I'm going to give you a real world example here. LinkedIn. Right. Right? There's a billion people on LinkedIn, one billion mm -hmm. business, right? Business people, people working, managers, owners. All it's cool. Billion people, all like professionals. 
-hmm. So you think I could go there and get my people, right? Do you think I could go there and get myself, you know, 100 clients, mm -hmm. 500 clients, 1,000 clients, I have a billion? Think that would work? Sounds like it would work, right? Sounds like, yeah. yeah. Until you do it. Mm -hmm. And then you realize, oops, let's see. So I love, my, my primary people are like service and trades area and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. People who are, you know, providing the service, doing a trade, something like that, working, right? They're working because they're trapped in the owner prison, right? Mm -hmm. So they're not some guy sitting around a CEO just spinning his desk looking at the view. Mm -hmm. That's not who my client is. Mm -hmm. My guy's making a million to 10 million, pumping, working hard every day, that kind of stuff. Well, mm -hmm. guess what? They're not hanging out on LinkedIn. No, they're not. They're running the business. Yeah, and they won't have time. Who right? are they serving? This is key. Yeah. Not, LinkedIn's like business to business. Yeah. My clients are business to consumer. Yeah. So when people are looking for them, they're on Google searching. Mm -hmm. Oh, let me look, let me look for this. Let me look for a plumber. Let me look for this. Let me, right. That's where they're at. So guess mm -hmm. where I have to go? I have to go to Google. Mm -hmm. I have to go find out where my guy, where my, where my ideal clients traffic is coming from. Mm -hmm. Where's their business coming from? Mm -hmm. I have to get there to get to them. Yeah. I, I spent a lot of money to figure that out. That's yeah. one of them. It's okay. So I'm, I'm saving you all a lot of money. Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> I, I personally invest in coaching and I've had multiple coaches tell me the same thing is when you hit that ideal client though, and I'll let you listeners know from experience too, it's worth the money. It's worth the time. It's worth the money because when you I have a business coach, first shout out to Dre Baldwin, he calls it the big domino. When you hit that big domino and you know your target and you're clear with them and you know specifically, you won't have the goal to waste your time on LinkedIn. You won't have the goal to waste your time on social media. If you go on there, it's a post and that's it. But you will more so know exactly who you're talking to, exactly what you offer, and you will feel like you're giving them. You can charge. If you're not turning people away based on how high you're charging, that means you're not, you're not moving close enough to your target. You have to be charging high ticket and it's because you deserve it. It's because you feel like you deserve, it. you know what you've been through. So you definitely deserve whatever number set the market. That's your responsibility. And when you get there, listeners, I'm telling you, I don't know if I'm who I'm talking to right now, but when you get there, listeners, I can speak from experience. It, it is amazing. It's the most amazing feeling in the world. So I love the way you broke it down too. So where you said this guy that you're serving, again, is not sitting up in some corporate office, spinning a wheel, looking at the view, waiting for his, you know, waiting for time off to go and play. No, he's actually on the ground making six figures, working, doing the job, actually doing it. And you're meeting him eye to eye and say, let's get busy. <laughs> let's get busy. Let's get in this room. Let's go up those four steps again, baby. And let's let's go. <laughs> you know what? Let me make a quick point about this LinkedIn yeah, thing so that you realized <laughs> was so the marketers who want to do this for me, right? Mm -hmm. If you hire these companies. Now we talk about doing business right, right? Doing it the right way. Why? And I filled out onboarding sheets. I'm talking hours and stuff. I got every detail. You, I can give you everything you could ever imagine about my clients, mm -hmm. right? I know all the pain, all the, I know everything about them, who they are, what they do. Cause I was it, mm -hmm. right? So I've been some years doing this. Do you think they would have said, you know, I don't think your guy's here you might want to do what I had to discover mm -hmm. where my clients are, but they were happy to take my money, string it out for three, four months. And then what? Oh, it doesn't work. I had to say it doesn't work. Exactly. I'm not getting any returns. So, so you have to be able to say here, this is a big takeaway for people in business. Are you able to tell someone your service is not for them and be okay with that? Mm -hmm. You know what? You're really not ready for this. I know you have the money, Mm -hmm. but you're not in a place to fully benefit from what I have to offer. Yeah. So I'm going to recommend you go to so-and-so or find someone else. Can you do that? Yeah. Do you have the character to be able to do that? Turn away business because it's not good for them. Yeah. It's great for you. It might be great for you, but it's not going to be great for them. Yeah, exactly. You can, when you can do that, that's a big step. Just like when someone, and my for my water future business, I have a contract and they send me the they're supposed to have a signed contract and send me a deposit mm -hmm. and they cross things out and they change the amount and they send this and I just what what what's that? I fold it back up, I stick it back in the envelope, and I mail it back to them. Mm -hmm. And they say, Why why'd you send back the check? I go, You don't alter my contract. Mm -hmm. 
You don't get to do that. You mm -hmm. don't change the numbers. We agreed upon this. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing that right now, I can only imagine what's going to happen during the, during the installation. Yeah. We're not working together. I love that. That his mind on me. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, I'm, you need me. I don't need you. I love I mean, that. That's the, that's my mind thought, but, but really you can't, you've got to do it. You have to benefit your clients. Yeah. Everything's for your client. Everything is to benefit your client. Yeah. It's all about the end product, the outcome, what this is going to do, how they're going to feel, how they receive this service, how the follow-up is. It's, there's a whole flow chart that goes into that, mm -hmm. right? When you do that, that's how you get your ideal clients. Because when you get that great one and you serve them the way they want to be served, what are they going to do? Mm -hmm. Who We talk about the circle. Who do you think they hang out with? Mm -hmm. Other great people. Other great people. Okay? And they're going to say, use, use my guy. Yeah, I, I love you that. To, you need to do that because one one quick thing. So let's talk about referrals really quick. Mm -hmm. So I come in and I do this. I, I build some incredible thing for you at your house. Let's say it's a water feature. It's amazing. Okay, well, you got your friend Jim and he wants what I have, what you have, right? You say, oh, oh you got to use my guy, man. Richard, he's the man. Okay, okay, he'll hook me up. So I hook him up, I call him, right? Mm -hmm. Now I go and I screw up the job. Okay. And I do kind of a bad job and I'm delayed and I'm whatever, something happened, whatever it was. So let me ask you out of me, you, mm -hmm. that's one who referred me and Jim, whose name's at the greatest risk here? Is it me, the bad contractor? Mm -hmm. Because I did a bad job. Now he's going to talk smack about me and don't ever hire me. Or is it Jim who's going to like, feel like an idiot. So now he's kind of feels bad. Or is it you as one, because you referred him. The referral. Who's the risk? It's the referral. It's the referral. Right. It's my name. It's Dude. my name. I, I've lived it. I've seen it. And I love the analogy because again, I I worked at a gym. All right. I worked at a gym and I was the overnight guy. They, they had a manager who would just sign anybody up. $10 a month, $10 a month, no real specific way of looking at people. And there was a lady walking in there who couldn't even walk. She could barely walk. She had to get her, her friend to even get it. I didn't sell her the gym membership. I come in the next day and she signed up with it and doesn't know how to use the waist, doesn't know how to use anything. I'm going to get deep on you in a second because during my time at the gym, I watched two people die. One had a massive heart attack and the other one was with a trainer and he had a massive heart attack. The defibrillator wasn't even open. You had ambulance come in, didn't know what was going on. And it was, again, $10 a month, you got your money, but a young boy lost his father. Uh, a woman lost her husband because of irresponsible business owners, because of irresponsible, okay, whatever, I got my money, I could show my owner, hey, I, you know, I made my sale, I got my units, all that kind of stuff. So this thing gets deep, folks, it gets deep. Every day I see that boy's eyes, like we locked eyes, it was maybe a week after he lost his father, we would lock eyes for maybe two or three seconds. And I'm like, <laughs> and that's when in my head, I had to get out of this business. I had to go do something that was moral because these things, they're wrong, folks. They're wrong. When you do business the wrong way, it costs people their lives. All right. This is so important stuff. This is really, really important. All right. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. It's and, and, and that's a great way to drive it home because mm -hmm. what we do matters. Yes. And, and again, I don't care what it, how insignificant you think it is. I don't care if you're you're, you're scooping poop in people's <laughs> yards. You're a pet waste. Dude, it matters how you do it. Mm -hmm. You have to get it all. Yes. You don't leave some mm -hmm. the next time, right? Because they won't know because the dog does this twice a day. You know what I'm saying? You do the best that you can do as thorough as you can. You always deliver more and more value than you're being paid for. Always, always. If you're man. going to build a business, you're going to design a business to run itself, which is what we do for our clients. Mm -hmm. I help them be a self-running business so they get their freedom. They're not tied to it. They're not chained to it, right? right? But to do that, you have to constantly deliver more value than you're being paid for. Mm -hmm. That's the referral aspect, right? So, so I can, I can, you know, I can excitedly refer someone to this my dog poop cleaning guy because mm -hmm. he's man. He never misses a turn. Never. Okay. But, like, I mean, I, it's as dumb as that sounds like, it's unbelievable. That's what I want to do because then I'm just going to pay that money every month. Yes. Happily. Right. He's going to come in and scoop his poop and it's awesome. Exactly. He's got a truck that says, you know, what, whatever. I mean, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter yeah. what you do. You just got to make sure you're doing it to the best of your ability. And 
you know, with all that, I, I do want to make sure, can you, well, as we close out, can you just tell people how they can get in touch with you, what you have coming next, how they can support you if they, um, if they're either a client or maybe they want to refer you to somebody, what's the best avenue for them to take? So sharpen the spear coaching.com. Mm -hmm. That's going to take you to my website. You can contact me through there. You're going to read a bunch of information on us. I just want to encourage people. Yes. You know, if you, if you know someone great, if you want to talk to me, do it, get in the contact, go in there. You can grab my book, escape the owner prison. You'll see that, but really just understand what we do. Okay. My goal is to help 10,000 business owners Mm -hmm. create more freedom, profit, and impact in their business. Okay. So freedom, right? We don't want to be changed to the business profit. We got to make money. We can't mm -hmm. help people without money. Without we money. need it. So let's yeah. make our business problem, but the impact, that's mm -hmm. what it's really about. How can you affect the people in your business? So they are affected by what they do with purpose and drive. They take that home to their families mm -hmm. that goes into their families. Their families are now in the community, right? So mm -hmm. 10,000 businesses doesn't sound a lot when there's 32 million small businesses in America. Mm -hmm. But you can, we can affect millions of people with that process. Yes. Getting the, our people into the family, into the community. Next thing you know, it's millions of people doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. So it's really powerful. It is. And, and uh, it's great that another lesson that you as a listener you have to take away, there's actual measurable goal. It's not just something, oh, I'm just going to help. It's gonna, there's an actual measurable number, attainable number. And that's that's how you set goals. And that, that'll be, that'll bring me to another hour of conversation. But <laughs> we won't do that to you, listeners, for now. Um, so, Richard, the way I close out all my shows is I have you, I want you to use your imagination for a little bit. I want you to go back to your 20, 21-year-old self. You're working at a bar. You don't know necessarily where life is going to take you. I want you to pretend that that young man just clicked in the Zoom room and I want you to just give him some words of encouragement and we'll officially close. You got to stick with what you decide. Okay. When you're bouncing around and I get it when you're young, you're going to bounce around, but I'll give you a quote that I've lived by for years and years. Okay. Dedication to a goal that never wavers resolution. This is the basic principle in the life of every truly great character. He who resolves upon any great and good end has by that very resolution clothed himself in power and has scaled the chief barrier to it. I have put that on my gym. I've kept that since 1990 six or 95 i read that and i'm going to attribute to steve ilg i don't know if he actually did it was in his book called the outdoor athlete he had, didn't have unknown and he just had the statement there mm -hmm. and then i memorized it and yeah. i've had it memorized for since 1995 but you take that yes take that and and take that in man understand that it ain't easy but you can do it if you stick to it man resolve Oof. Amen to that, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on. This has been incredible. I know I know, I personally got a lot out of it. And you listeners, were, again, as promised, you were treated to something incredible. Do go, do what you got to do, man. Go back, listen to it, rewind, take notes. There was a lot, a lot that was said today. It's important that you take everything in, everything that we talked about in, and do what it is you have to do to make, make sure you get better the next day, all right? So with all that being said, Fellow teammates, continue to move swiftly. We will talk more soon.